Before we begin, um, can you guys say your names and your pronouns? My name is Brooke Pepian Swaney, and I use she, her pronouns. And hi, my name is Kendra Milnichuk Potter. I also use she, her pronouns. I'm Mal Sotelo, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, all right. My name is Mal Sotelo from Crater High School's Team Press. Today I'm here with Brooke and Kendra. And I have to say, after seeing your movie, I was emotional. Uh, it was such a beautiful piece. It inspired me with some questions. So I'm really glad um, you guys are here to answer them. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, really, really excited. Thank you so much for asking. So after the film's release, have you guys heard any stories of uh, any other lost birds who saw the film and then decided to search for their own tribal homelands? Ooh, that's a great question. It's a great question. I, I'm going to start talking, Brooke. Is that okay? Yeah, and I you think you're thinking. Good. Okay. Um, so up to this point, I haven't met any, anyone who would qualify as a lost bird, which is, you know, this very specific generation of, uh, of people who, uh, my hope is that someone is eventually inspired to make um, make some some attempts to reach their community. But um, you know, so far it's been a pretty. We haven't had a, a huge audience yet, is what I tell myself. Though I will say that it's sparked a lot of conversations among people that I know who ha who are maybe not not necessarily lost birds, haven't necessarily been adopted out, but are feeling, uh, we're feeling compelled to do a little more digging or um, connection to their community, specifically around like visiting homelands and visiting their reservations. Um, but no, not yet, though it's something that I hope, I hope happens. Do you know anyone, Brooke? You know, nobody's kind of come forward with um, with the story about themselves yet, but I hope that we'll get to have one of those experiences. We have been able to um, connect with a woman, her name is Sandy Whitehawk, and she also was an indigenous transracial adoptee and was born during the, in, the, the era of the Indian Adoption Project. And um, we're able to talk a little bit about the film with her. Um, and she has a, a whole organization that helps um, Native folks reconnect with their tribal homelands. Um, and she does a, 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 actually a welcome home powwow for people. And powwows aren't necessarily traditional depending on where you're from, but um, she does that work. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, on to my next question. Um, knowing how much teens and adults struggle with their identity or cultural roots, what advice advice would you give to anyone in this situation? I think it's now, so you asked really hard questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah, I love the dive right in. You're uh, this is great. I I think it's so personal to, I mean, it's there's you know, even just within the context of our film, we have, you know, two characters, we've got myself and then my birth mother, and our lived experience is so wildly different, it would be, um, and, and I mean, I think just try is the best, I, the best advice I have, find, even if you don't have anyone in your tribal community, um, I found a brook, it's a good idea to find a brook, like find a friend who is connected to their community and um, they, they may be able to guide you through some steps that you wouldn't even know where to put your feet. I think a lot of, a lot of the, the journey that I've had is only because of the, the friends and support systems who were able to sort of help me make the connections that I wouldn't have known how to make. So I think resource yourself, um, but ask for help, I think is probably some advice and be brave because it's really nerve wracking. 
say, you know, that's why asking for help, right? You know, sometimes a lot of things in life you can't do necessarily alone. And so it's really good to have um, community and support, whether it's through friends or, you know, per a person that is a mentor or something like that. Okay, my next question is for Kendra. Um, how has reunited with um, the Lumi tribe affected your relationship with your adoptive parents? That's also a good question. <laughs> uh, it's been really uh, over, uh, astonishing how supportive my adoptive parents have been through this entire journey. I think probably as scared as I was or nervous as I was to go through this. I think that my parents were twice as nervous um, and, and they never asked me not to. They always, you know, stayed on the supportive side of things and have, we've, we've had some moments of like trying to figure out how, how much support was like them being present and how much support was them staying back and like letting me move, you know, move through this. Um, yeah, and I think if I'm perfectly honest, it has created some tensions and some distance, um, but, but, nev but it has not, diminish the the love or the like admiration I think mutual admiration that we have for one another has has stayed and and there's yeah there's like confusion certainly that still is there for both of us um but but hasn't you know my mom is like definitely still my mom like eye rolling and like mom god uh like all of that is still there and also mom can you help me do the thing like our relationships the, the, the dynamics of of the roles that they have in my life is exactly the same um and the way that we relate to one another hasn't shifted at all but but like the identity stuff is is certainly I think con interesting for everyone that I'm related to. I mean, my husband married a white woman and now he's married to a native woman and like navigating the identity politics of what that has become. Um, you know, I gave birth to my daughter and, and the dynamics of our relationship and my husband's relationship to parenting her has shifted as, as I've learned more. And it's, yeah, so it's, it's in, a, it's in flux, but I think that anyone who is uh, trying to unpack their personal identity within the context of dominant culture, I hope is in some state of flux most of the time. Mine is maybe just a little more fluxy. <laughs> I think seeking out your birth mom definitely took courage. How did you find the courage to seek her out? I said yes to making a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I really, I really think I would have not done it a couple of times if I hadn't made a commitment. Um, and um, and really, I, I think my, my daughter was the other thing. Like I, I didn't, I wanted her to know more than I knew. And in order for her to know more, I was gonna have to learn more. In the film, your biological mom shows where she used to live in Portland when she was young and homeless and points out the city's public bathrooms that she relied on to keep warm. At this time, you would have been living with your adoptive family. So how did it feel to hear this memory of hers? That bathroom story is a block away from the high school that I went to, St. Mary's Academy, which is in like downtown Portland. And it's literally a block and a half from the fountain she lived under. And um, it, it wasn't, we weren't overlapping. I mean, by the time I was in high school, she was no longer homeless but um 
the the knowledge that we were like so physically close and we found out that we like hung out at the same coffee shop at the same time in my life and like we could have been doing late night coffee at the same time and just not known that we were sitting in the same place it was really kind of bonkers yeah. Yeah. Do you incorporate the things that you learn um, learn from the Lumi tribe into your parenting? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, um, I mean, little, just little things so far, right? Like I'm still really unsure about a lot, but I'm learning um, at the end, when we bless our food at the beginning of our meals, we now say haishka at the end. We've learned this is thank you to creator. Um, and I've begun practicing elements of moon practices, um, that I've learned from my great aunt and the way that I sort of observe my own cycle is att our attempts to help my children understand cycles in human bodies and female bodies. Um, yeah, and learning, you know, learning some stories and sharing the stories with the kids. Yeah, it's absolutely in small ways. And my daughter and I are like trying to learn the language very, very slowly. <laughs> a couple words here and a couple words there. What is one really impactful life lesson you have learned from your Lumi tribe? There is a story that my aunt Julia uh, sent to me that, which is kind of ironic because she's not Lummy, uh, she's Aleut, but she's my birth mother, April's half sister. And she lives, uh, she lives at Lummy. And she sent me an origin story about Salmon Woman. And in the story, it's explaining why the salmon come only once a year and um that that the reason that they only come once a year is because there was an ungrateful child who was like salmon again because they have salmon all the time <laughs> and so you have to be grateful for what you have in order to continue to receive um and i have taken that lesson in that story like very much to heart and have incorporated a much more like intentional gratitude practice that I would absolutely attribute to like the one origin story I know from the Lummi people. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brooke, we know you mentioned in your film that you were worried about how your questions would influence, um, would have an influence on Kendra. Since many documentary and share the same concern, how would your inquiries or even presence of a camera um, can change the outcome of a subject response? How do you work around this? Again, with these amazing questions. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not really a documentary filmmaker. I just happened to make a documentary film um, I was trained uh, to make fiction films. So this was a really interesting thing for me um, to try to uh, capture real, real life. And that idea of, um, you know, really kind of this pure documentary where you're just observing things and letting things unfold um, is a, to me a real uh, fallacy because you're not, as soon as you, as a person step into a space, you're gonna change it. Um, and then as soon as you bring a camera that's like documenting and people are aware of, you're gonna change the environment. So the way to reduce that um, discomfort and that impact is in my opinion, to try to limit the amount of um, kind of a footprint that you leave um, in whatever environment that you're coming into. Um, so whether that's um, basically being kind of a one, 
woman show uh, when we filmed Kendra and um, April meeting for the first time, it was just me and this weird camera setup that was a disaster and a Zoom recorder for sound. And then when we went to the Lummi Nation um, for during the Stamish Festival, uh, the first time that we went up there, we actually had a pretty big crew, which I think in some ways changed the way that you know people interacted with us. And um, there are parts of me that think it probably would have been better to just have had two, maybe three people at the at the most, um, you know, being on the crew. So that that I think that's the way that I can, you know, as a filmmaker, uh, change the environment and the way that. Um, you know, people are able to get comfortable with the presence of the camera. And then just be around all the time. <laughs> now, what's next on your guys' film list? Are you guys creating anything new? Oh. Well, I'll start first um, and <laughs> Kendra can pop in. But, um, you know, right now with the film, we're kind of in this festival circuit and um, the film is making its way, you know, to Ashland and we'll also be screening at the Woodstock Film Festival and the Vancouver Film Festival this fall. And, you know, if you have family or friends that haven't been able to see the film, that they'll, there will be ways for them to see it. And then we have a distributor uh, a distribution company called uh, Women Make Movies, who is helping us to get the story out in other spaces. So we're also looking to attend some conferences and create a package for educational purposes, maybe for high schools and universities so that the film can be used in um, whatever ways educators see fit to, you know, whether it's with, uh, Brooke was on a call earlier with the, a group of psychologists, um, Native American psychologists, or, um, you know, people who are working in social work or indigenous law programs. Um, and so that they can use it as a tool to sort of explain um, from a more personal, narrative story rather than a bunch of statistics. Uh, so we'll be sending the film around and hopefully doing some speaking engagements as well with it. Yeah, that's that project. So I'm, I'm working on I'm working on a script and um, I recently attended a, um, a residency in upstate New York um, for this project and it's really new. Um, so that's, that's, uh, I don't want to talk about it too much because it's pretty new. And then um, I'm also, I, I also wrote a pilot um, comedy script, half hour comedy script with a writing partner of mine. Um, and so we're, we're now shopping it around um, to, to different um, networks and stuff. I'm, uh, I'm in like zygote baby stages of working on a script about missing and murdered indigenous women and um, the loss of culture and lack of representation uh, that I also don't wanna to talk too much about because I don't know that much yet, but it's coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to talk and meet with me um, today. Kendra, I really enjoyed hearing about your reconnection with um, Alumni Tribe and Brooke, thank you for sharing um, uh, all your information about uh, docu your document documentary and uh, your creation process. Thank you, Mal. Thank you, Mal, so much for taking the time. You really, these, I wish everybody's questions for this good. Yeah. <laughs> it's really nice. Mm -hmm.